Uh, as Tim said, we are in Hosea 9, uh, ch uh, chapter 9, verses 10 to 17. So we're kind of hitting the last part of the chapter from last week. And I'd like to begin with a, a question. This is a question that uh, would normally come up in an English 11 class, maybe, especially if you're studying Shakespeare, everyone's favorite. Uh, a question that I often asked uh, of the students was, uh, how do you tell the difference uh, between a Shakespearean play, uh, whether it is a comedy or a tragedy? Uh, it's a little tough to tell, because uh, in the middle of the play, there's, there's kind of a little of both, meaning there can be tragedies that are kind of funny, and there can be comedies where people die. Uh, the key, really, for telling the difference is the end. Okay, at the end of a Shakespearean uh, tragedy, uh, most people do die. Uh, but at the end of a comedy, uh, everyone gets married. I don't know why. It's not, it's not ha-ha funny. It's just it's the label of a comedy. That's, there's joy at the end of those kinds of plays. There's a big difference. You have to wait till the end to kind of see for sure how it's going to go. So here's our question for this morning. What kind of a story is the story of Israel? Uh, the story of Israel is something we've been looking at through Hosea, or right in the middle of, of the people of God in the Old Testament. What, what kind of a story is it? Is it a tragedy? Is it a comedy? If you've read, even read the book of Hosea or heard one sermon, you know that it probably leans towards tragedy. Uh, we've been here for a while, and there's a lot of heavy text. There's a lot of proclamations of judgment from the prophet of God to the people of God who are not in a good place. He's been telling them, the Assyrians are coming. They're going to destroy the nation. But Let's, let's not be too quick in deciding what kind of a story this is. In fact, our text uh, today is a good opportunity to think big picture because in these seven verses, we, we basically get the story of Israel. In these seven verses, kind of where they're at, where they've been, where they're going. So we're going to read it, and we're going to think big picture about this story and come to a conclusion. And I'd remind you uh, that this isn't just kind of an exercise in biblical history or, or even English literature. This, is, this really is a story about us, because Israel is God's people, and if you're here this morning and you're a believer, that, that means that's us as well. So we're going to ask a few questions to guide our time, and the first one is this. How did the story of Israel begin? Verse 10, our first verse, really gives a concise answer. God says this, like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. So not a lot of detail, but you definitely get some key impressions there, right? The imagery that's used uh, is one of tenderness, one of delight. Uh, it's a little tougher for us to tell, but for the people at the time, grapes, I mean, grapes were choice fruits that only grew in the most fertile of, of land, figs were highly valued, it took a long time apparently to get a fig tree to actually produce any fruit. So when there was finally a fig on a tree, you, everyone would be excited, it would delight in it. And so here God is describing the joy of his, of his heart of initiating this relationship with his people. He said, I found Israel. He is the one who started this all off and they were a delight to him. The reference to the fathers, he says, I saw your fathers, uh, are to the, the leaders of Israel throughout the years, right? The Abraham, the Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, David, King Solomon. Now, none of these men were perfect by any means, uh, but they were shaped by God, and they were used by God to really grow and cultivate his people. In fact, the golden days of Israel were the days of King David and Solomon. Uh, there was a tiny nation, right? Israel's not very big. Uh, it was known, though, for its military strength, for its cultural beauty, for the wisdom of its king, for the power of its God. Okay, this was a nation that was known the world over. Uh, people would travel from afar to come and, and hear the wisdom of the king of Israel. They, they, they saw the glory of God through the people. It was like the heyday, a beautiful time, where the people knew who they were as God's people and his glory was reflected through them. Their feasts and festivals, everything about the way they lived their lives was like, this is our God. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He chose us. We are loved. The deep sense of identity. If, if, if they were a married couple, this would be like the honeymoon period. And, and sometimes the honeymoon period can be an extended period of time, right? Not just a, a night or, or a vacation, but the first few years, right? Before, before kids, right? It's a lot less stressful, a lot more disposable income, right? It's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. This, this is what we see in the early part and even into the middle part of Israel's history. But 
But that's not the whole story of Israel. In fact, after King Solomon, things go bad very, very quickly. Uh, King Solomon's, his sons fought over the throne for Israel. The, the whole kingdom was divided, fractured, and then divided into two. The people began to set up false places of worship and false gods, which led to the impending destruction. This is what Hosea is all about, that things are not going well, that God is telling them, look, you're going to be taken off into exile because of your idol worship. And the question comes up when we think of this big story is how, like how could everything crumble so quickly for Israel? Well, it turns out that Israel's downfall didn't just happen all of a sudden. It wasn't just right after King Solomon that everything kind of, you know, fell, fell apart. The seeds of destruction were sown in the relationship between God and his people much, much earlier. Uh, again, as a parable for marriage, that there are oftentimes that married couples will come and speak to me. They're at a point of crisis, w- whatever it is, a huge argument, some, some big betrayal. Uh, and and it's a, it is a crisis moment, but as you begin to dialogue with the couple, as I begin to talk and ask questions, you realize that the seeds of this moment actually came years earlier with much smaller instances of of crisis or sin, Uh, neglect, selfishness, a lack of affection, lack of interest in each other, right? These crisis moments don't just happen in relationships with each other and, and in our faith. So here's the second question. How did things go so very wrong for Israel? Well, in our text, uh, Hosea, or God through Hosea, gives us uh, two stories Two stories that is just briefly stated, but for the people, they would have known exactly what Hosea was talking about. So two stories, and I've named them. The first one is this, seduction at Baal Peor. That's story number one, and we get it in just like half a verse. Here's uh, verse 10b. God says, but they, my people, they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. Now, the people right away would have known what he was talking about. For us, we need to go back into the, into the history. This is found in Numbers 22 to 25. Uh, basically, the story is this. It was early in the days of Israel. Moses had led them out of Egypt. It, w- it was a good time. They were sensing the presence and power of God. They were entering into this new land, and they were conquering some of the armies that were coming against them. And they had camped out in the fields, uh, kind of the plains of Moab. Uh, the king of Moab looked at this, and he was concerned. Because there were a lot of them. There was like a million Israelites at the time. That's a lot of people. But also, he had seen their power. It seemed like God was with them. And he was concerned. Like, if they're going to conquer all these other people, they're going to come and take over my whole land. So he has a plan. He gets his prophet. His prophet's name is Balaam. And he says, look, I want you to curse these people. Okay, this was a legit prophet. And so he knew whatever, if he cursed them, they would be cursed by God. So he said, I want you to curse them. And then I'm going to go in with my army. And uh, even though they're bigger than me, I'm going to take them out. Seems like a good plan. The only problem is, every time Balaam tries to curse the people of God, a blessing comes out of his lips. It's very frustrating for everyone involved. He says, okay, I'm going to do it. And then he goes and tries to curse them, blessing, right? All these kind things from the Lord. And so the king's like, well, go over to that mountain. Go to another place. He goes to another place, tries to curse them, blessings of God. He, because God is, is blessing Israel. He's not going to allow them to be cursed. And so the king says, okay. I can't, I'm not going to be able to conquer them with my army. Clearly, I can't bring spiritual power against them. So he has a new idea. He decides that he's going to corrupt the people of Israel. And and here's how he does it. Apparently, the women of Moab were very, very beautiful. And so he sent the women from his his people in uh, to the Israelites uh, to seduce them. And through that, they were seduced not just sexually, but into uh, spiritual idolatry. Here's how it reads in Numbers 25. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. See, this was a turning point for Israel. They had, they had dabbled in idol worship before, even more than that, but this time it was more than just a passing thing. In our text, verse 10, it says they consecrated themselves to the thing of shame. To be consecrated means to be declared sacred, to be, to be bonded, to be united. And the Israelites were supposed to be you know, consecrated to God, to be united with the holy God. But here they unite themselves to pagan gods, 
which is like a, a husband or a wife inviting someone else into their, their bed. You're united in sin with that person, and it corrupts them in the process. Verse 10 uh, says they became detestable, like the thing they loved. This is the devious nature of sin and idolatry. It isn't something that just happens outside of us or something we do kind of with our bodies. It's something that corrupts us from within because it involves our heart. And once the Israelites got a taste of the, of the sexual pagan rituals, it plagued them over and over again. For, for years, right up in time to the time of Hosea, this is hundreds of years later, and the book that we've been reading is basically all about this trouble, how it's, it's weakened, de- destabilized the faith and relationship that the people have with their God. This was one of the seeds of destruction that had been sown years earlier and that eventually grew and then choked out the entire garden of God's blessing. Now, before we move on to the second story, let's pause for a moment and, and remember, again, this is not just the story of God's people back then. Uh, they are our story. This same dynamic happens with us today. And what we're seeing here is that seduction is a far greater threat to our faith than any type of persecution or opposition. I think as Christians, we often get caught up with the idea that we need to be able to defend our faith intellectually, and of course we do. We need to be able to, to engage with the ideologies of the world or false doctrine. We need, we need to be able to do that. But, but if you think about it, most of the, of the reasons for uh, churches falling apart or families falling apart doesn't, isn't usually to do with heresy. Sometimes, but more of the time, it's to do with moral failing. It's the fact that the, the people have allowed themselves to be seduced. And that seduction has undermined their, their understanding of God, their, their sense of moral rightness, and the relationships, both with people and, and with God himself. So this is a warning that we should consider carefully. Right? If we want to preserve our faith, we should, be, we should be ready to defend it, we should be ready to articulate the things that we believe, but we should be even more wary of, uh, wary of seductive pleasures that seem very sweet in the moment, but, but will destroy us. And of course, I'm talking about lust, but I'm also talking about all other manner of sin, right? Envy, uh, gluttony, greed, bitterness, gossip. Just think of how sweet it, it feels to know something about someone that someone has talked like, behind their back. There's something twisted in us, right? That, that that's just pleasurable to find out something, to tell it to someone else, right? In the moment, it, it seems like a good thing. We don't realize it's the very act of doing that is it's seducing us. It's, it's taking us in a direction where, where the relationships in our lives will be fractured. We'll be constantly talking about each other than talking to each other. It's how, it's how churches are pulled apart. So this, this is what happened to Israel. These are some of the seeds that were planted way back in the day, this allowing themselves to be seduced, uniting themselves with sin and idolatry, and it was was bearing this this wicked fruit in the days of Hosea. But there's another story. Story number two, rejection at Gilgal. And again, it's in just two verse, uh, part of a verse, verse 15. Hosea says, every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. Uh, There I began to hate them. Those are the words of God. God says, at that place, Gilgal, I began to hate them, which is very strong language. We have to ask ourselves, what, what is it that happened in Gilgal that would make God hate his people? And what happened was very simple. Saul, the first king of Israel, Saul was crowned king at Gilgal. Look at 1 Samuel 11. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Which doesn't sound that bad if you look at it. It's a part. It's a, they're excited. They have a king. That's a good thing. And it looks like he's a king before the Lord. That seems good. They're sacrificing peace offerings. That also seems good. Why, why is this not a good memory? Why, why is this a moment where God began to hate them? I mean, isn't it a good thing that they would have a king? And the answer is, of, of course, it's good for the people to have a king. But, but they already had a king. God was their king. God had been their, their king, their ruler, their authority since he, since he chose them. He found them. But the people got it into their heads. They wanted a king like all the other nations. They wanted a king they could look at and see and talk to. And they went to Samuel, the prophet, said, we want a king. And Samuel's like, this is not a good idea. This is not God is your king. They're like, no, we really want it. 
And so look, look at the ultimate response from God. This is back in, in again, 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, because Samuel came to the Lord and said, what are we going to do with these people? They're nuts. Here's what God said. Obey the voice of the people and all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. See what he's saying. He's saying, look, this, this is just an outflow of their heart. They, they clearly don't, they don't want me. They haven't wanted me for a long time. He, he talks about since the day of Egypt, there's been ways in which they've forsaken God. And so he's saying this, this final rejection of him is just, it's what's in their heart. God knows it to be true. He sees his people clearly. Which is why it's the moment that he began to hate Israel. Uh, that word hate uh, in Hebrew is, uh, is rejection. So in a sense, you have the people re rejecting God and God rejecting them. But the rejection, that word in Hebrew, it's like it's got a spectrum. It can be very cold and harsh, or it can be more like a heartbrokenness. And, and that's, that's the sense we get here, that God is heartbroken in his rejection of his, his people because he sees them for as they truly are. It, think of it again in terms of marriage. Imagine a wife who, who sees that her husband has a wandering eye. Like she knows that, that, that he's, he's looking at other women, he's flirting with women all the time at work, and she tries to talk to him about it, and he just brushes it off. It's not a big deal, right? It's just the way I am. Eventually, she gets to the point where she sees his heart clearly. She, 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 she hates him. She rejects him. What does that mean? It doesn't mean she's left the marriage right away. It just means there's a wall now up between her and him because she sees him more clearly than he can see himself. She knows where this is, where this is going. And so the fundamental nature of their relationship changes because of his heart, his wayward heart, his betraying heart. This is the way it was for Israel and God. And again, we need to understand, this is not just their story. This is our, this is our story, even today. Okay, when we, when we ignore the Bible, for instance, we read it, we see certain things it says, but we, we don't submit to it. That's, that's us rejecting God. That's the same, the same idea as what the people were doing. God, I know you're there. I know you, in a sense you're my king, but I'd, I'd rather be in charge of this area of my life. When we resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the sense of, of our own conscience, you know, when we feel bad about something, that we should go and do something, and we don't do it because it's, I don't know what, it's scary, it's unknown. We, we, when we do that, we're essentially saying, God, I, I don't want you to be in charge of me. I, I'm going to be in charge of this area of my life. It's the same dynamic. We're turning our backs on God. And when we do that, what this is showing us is we step out of the light of his grace into the darkness of his wrath. See, somehow we've gotten this idea that, you know, God is just happy to have any, any sense of connection with us. Like he's just like a sad little puppy. You know, the puppies, you treat them horribly. They're just, they're just happy to get any, any affection. That God's just happy that, that we're here sometimes. You know, that we pray sometimes. Or we read the Bible sometimes. Anything. He, we think that that's, that's all he wants from us. We, we totally misunderstand who he is. He's not a sad little puppy. The Bible says he's a lion. He's fierce in love, but he's also fierce in anger. So the real question, when we're thinking of the story of Israel, is how, how does this story end? How, how, in light of all this, in light of all this turmoil and trial, how does this story end? And frankly, as I've said, if we read through Hosea, it doesn't seem to end very well. And I'm going to read through the rest of our text. And, and again, if you're thinking in Shakespearean terms, this clearly seems like a tragedy, an epic tragedy where these people who've been loved by God, chosen by God, and, and, and taken through all, I mean, miracle after miracle, saving them in so many ways, providing for them, and yet they turn their back and they just ruin it all. And now we see God responding to them with the anger that they deserve. So here's the rest of our text, 11 to 17. Uh, God uses the, the name Ephraim, which is another word for Israel. So he's talking about his people. Verse 11, Ephraim's glory, he says, shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. 
Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Every evil of theirs is in Gilgal. There I began to hate them. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. My God will reject them. Because they have not listened to him, they shall be wanderers among the nations." If this is a tragedy, then it makes sense that God would behave this way. The whole point of Baal worship was to increase fertility. Fertility of their crops, fertility in their families. There was a time when the people looked to God for that, right? God himself would come and hover over the, the people, over the temple, over the tabernacle. He was their glory. He was their hope. They looked to everything to him, but... But Israel had changed. And now the glory of their lives is really in themselves. Their hope for the future, their, their, their significance was all wrapped up in their family legacy. That's why there's so much here about, about children. See, they worship the Baals and the false pagan gods, and those gods are supposed to open their wombs, they're supposed to increase their family, but God is revealing the flaw of this misguided hope because he's going to destroy the glory that they have now, this lesser glory of their family legacy, their family line, and he's going to destroy it in two ways. See this language, very harsh language. He said he's going to give them widespread barrenness. Verse 11, no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. And he says he's going to destroy the children that they have through war and exile. He says, Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter in verse 13. He says, I will put their beloved children to death in verse 16. This is the essence of a tragedy. Okay, a, a tragic character has a tragic flaw, which means they come to a bitter end because of themselves, because of something that's broken and, and crooked within them. And that's what we're seeing here with Israel. Okay, they've, they've rejected God. They, they put all their hope in the Baals who are going to bring them fertility, and the end is not fertility but barrenness, uh, emptiness, emptiness. All of their glory, this lesser glory is gone. It flies away. But it's not just the future generations that are wiped out. God, God says that the people themselves are going to be cut off from him. Uh, some of the language again, very decisive, very final. He says, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. I will reject them. It, it does really seem to be the final end of a tragic love story. It seems like God is saying, I've, I've had enough of their games enough of their betrayal, enough of their wicked hearts. Like the flood, right? He's bringing divine justice to bear upon the sins of the people. The Assyrians coming in is a just end to these wicked people who betrayed the one who loved them and saved them. There is one verse, however, in all of this that doesn't totally fit this ending, this idea of a tragic end. I'm not sure if you noticed it, but there's one verse that is not like the others. Verse 14. Verse 14 is interesting because these are not the words of God. Okay, these are actually Hosea's words. You know how prophecy works? God gives you know, words to the prophet and he's saying this is what God is saying. But, but look at verse 14. At, in the middle of the prophecy, Hosea begins to pray for the people. He says, give them, O Lord. And then it's like he doesn't know how to finish the prayer. Uh, what will you give? Because imagine him in that moment. How do you pray for these people? Right? Do you, what do you pray for? What, what, would be, what would you want God to do in these people's lives? You can tell Hosea's he's kind of stuck. Right? His natural inclination is to pray for these poor people. All these things are going to happen. Give them, O Lord. What will you give them? And notice how he finishes the prayer. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. He, he basically ends up agreeing with God of what, what God is doing, that he would bring this this trial and adversity into their lives. So a couple questions come up. Number one, why would God include this in, in this prophecy, like in this part of scripture? It's such an interesting thing that, that this hesitation of the prophet of how to pray for the people would be in, included. Why, why would God include that? And what does is, what is actually it ultimately mean? 
I think the reason he included it is because this passage that we're reading is not a word of ultimate judgment against the people. This is not the final word for his people, that God is at work. So let me ask this question to help us understand this. How do you think we should pray for someone in our life who's had a sense of faith, maybe an expression of faith as a Christian, but then they've walked away from God? Like, how do we, how do we pray for those people? Uh, we, we love them. They may be close to us. Maybe it's a friend or a child or a, a spouse. At one point, they seem to say, no, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. But then, but then they've gone in the opposite direction. What is the most loving way to pray for that person? I was reading a book recently uh, about a family in that situation. Uh, the book is called Come Back, Barbara. Uh, it's about a family whose daughter, Barbara, uh, she, she basically left the faith, left the church at age 18. Uh, the book is written by the father and actually Barbara herself later on who, who came back to faith. It's very interesting. But they kind of go through the story. And at that moment when their daughter left, I mean, it was just devastating for the family, as you can imagine. She was 18. It was the 1970s, and so she did what every young, angry teenage girl would do in the 1970s, dropped out of college, went partying with her friends, multiple relationships, multiple guys, lots of drugs, rock and roll, which isn't necessarily sin. I'm just including it. It goes part of the package, <laughs> right? And things really got worse and worse. I mean, it was... It was, they didn't know what to do at all or how to care for their daughter. And at first, you can imagine, they tried to clamp down tightly, right? Try to know that's not who you are. That's not how we raised you. Tried to make her fit into this certain Christian box, but it didn't work. She pushed back more and more, ran farther and farther. For years, this went on. To the point that four years later, she was in a relationship with a guy who was basically a drug dealer, had a big house in the Poconos, which is not an island. I thought it was, it's the mountains near New York, they had cars, she had everything, she had everything that she'd wanted. Money, freedom, this extravagant lifestyle. Her parents were still at a loss. How, how are we to love our daughter? How can we hopefully get her back to see her need for the Lord? Well, the book chronicles how that happens, but two things I want to highlight. The first thing that, that God did is that he humbled her parents. He taught them. What it really means to love your daughter is not to love a version of your daughter that is perfect and clean and squeaky clean the way that you would want her to be. You're to love her as she is. This was very humbling for them, very difficult. But they learned that that's, that's actually how God loves us. Not, not the future version of us, but us right now in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our brokenness. The second thing is that uh, they had a renewed sense of prayer, a renewed conviction of praying for their daughter. And this is what, you know, came to my mind as I was thinking about this passage, because I want to read to you how they prayed for their daughter in this situation. This is just a part from the book. The dad writes this. He said, we began to pray specifically for Barbara. With emphatic agreement, Rosemary, his wife, and I asked God to expose Barbara to the thorns of life and to use their sharp points to drive her out of her evil nest in the Poconos, the drug dealer guy, we finally gather our courage and ask God to make life so unbearable with John that she would want to leave him. And God heard that prayer early in 1977. For months, Barbara had had so much restlessness, so much sickness, so much tussle with living with John that she finally decided to give it all up. And here's Barbara's take. She said, all of a sudden, I left. The whole way of life that I was living was awful. She said, he was always mixing all kinds of drugs and that lifestyle, the cocaine made him paranoid. He was really trying to take me farther and farther away from my family. I must have been crazy to do it for so long. And then her father summarizes, at last, he said, she knew that happiness did not consist of spending a couple of thousand dollars on clothes and driving off in a green Jaguar. He says, we Americans sometimes have trouble getting over our adolescence. Barbara's was being squeezed out of her right down to the last drop. The pain must have been terrible, but the results were liberating. Notice that the prayer from her parents, it, it wasn't one of retribution. It wasn't one of control. They weren't trying to, you know, prove a point to her. It was out of love and concern for her. But they didn't just pray for God's blessing. See, sometimes with the people in our lives in that situation, we just play a general sense of blessing. God, I pray you bless them. I pray you draw them back to yourself some, somehow. But sometimes, a lot of the times, the greatest blessing 
for the lost people in our lives would be that God would bring trials into their lives so they would see the emptiness of their life. This is what God does for all of us. All of us who are blinded by perhaps the seduction of sin that we've given ourselves over to, perhaps the, the sense of authority that we want, if God loves us, he's going to bring trials into our lives. He's going to expose the emptiness, the thorns of life, so that we would see him more clearly. This is what Hosea was praying for Israel. Right? This, this is why he stopped partway through his prayer. He was probably going to pray, God, I pray you would, you would make things good. Right? Bless your people. You love your people. But, but he saw God's wisdom in what God was doing. And so he agreed with him. But his prayer is not a prayer of condemnation. Even though he's praying for, for hardship and adversity, it's actually a prayer of hope. In fact, this entire passage is a passage of hope because in it, God is revealing the bitter end that will come to everyone who ultimately rejects him, but, but the end isn't there yet. And this is not the end that God wants for his people. It's not how he wants the story to end. God is making clear, look, I'm not going to tolerate ongoing betrayal in perpetuity, but he's also making clear that he's not going to abandon his people. See the tension within the Lord, a tension of, of holiness and justice against sin, but also love for his people. The hope in this, though, the reason it, it makes sense, it doesn't, like if God was a person and he was trying to keep loving someone who's betraying him over and over again, n n none of God's best friends would say this is a good idea. We'd say, what are you doing? What hope do you have that this person is ever going to change? They've shown you they're not going to change. God knew that his people weren't going to change on their own. But he also knew that he would be at work, that through his power and his grace, there would be a renewal in his people in time. And in fact, that's, that's some of the other prophecies that we see at this time. Not from Hosea, but from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel, prophesying around the same time, same idea, there's going to be judgment, but also he points forward to the relationship of God and his people and how it will ultimately come together. Here's Ezekiel 11, 17 to 20. He says, thus says the Lord God. So God says, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. That's after the exile. The exile's coming. You're going to be destroyed. But later, later when you're scattered, I will, I will gather you in and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come here, they will remove from it all its detestable things, all its abominations, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh and that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. You, you see the picture. This is the way it always should have been, that the people would walk in the statutes of God, that they would have a heart for the Lord, but it would only happen when God intervened, when God would change their heart. And you can imagine people hearing that prophecy thinking, how would that ever happen? How, after everything that's gone on, after all the interventions from God, all the amazing miracles, and the people still are, are seduced, still are rejecting God, how is that ever going to happen? And the answer is, it had to wait. It had to wait for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to bring about an open door to relationship with God where sin was no longer an issue because the blood of Jesus had atoned for the sin of the people, because the work of Jesus, his perfect life, and then his perfect death on our behalf, all of a sudden, all the detestable things, like it says in our lives, are wiped away, and we were able to interact with God in the way that, that we should have always done, but we couldn't do it on our own. So God is saying, look, there will be a way for this love story to end well, but it isn't because of you, it's because of me. So here's the answer to our question. How, how does the story end? Not with tragedy, but with grace and with joy. And in fact, uh, if we look at the very end of the Bible, we do, we do actually see a wedding, which may be where Shakespeare got the idea. I don't know. But here's what we see. Revelation 19, 6 to 8 says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready and has granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. We are the bride, and he is the groom. 
The love story of God and his people will end with joy. It will be for his glory. It will be for our good because he's going to redeem his people. He's going to renew his people. He is doing that now through the work of Christ, through the work of his spirit. So here's the final point of application for us. I think sometimes we feel like our lives or the lives of people we know that they are a tragedy, that that is not going to end well. We look at some of the circumstances of our lives, the trials, the difficulties, and we can't reconcile it with a God who says he loves us so much and yet these things are, are happening. Or we look to someone in our life that has just abandoned their, their faith perhaps and we think, Lord, how, how is this ever going to come back together? How can I ever have hope again? But what we need to see here, I mean, there are points where we should feel conviction. Make no mistake, right? He mentions those moments in Israel's history because those are points where there should be repentance. If we are allowing ourselves to be seduced, if we are rejecting the authority of God, we, we should feel that conviction. We should see where that road leads. But the big picture of the story is that there is always hope. When God is involved, when God is in the relationship, there is always hope. He is at work, even in the trials, even through the trials, using them, sometimes bringing them to expose our sin, to help us to see the things that we can't see, to, to, to open our eyes that are blind to the things that are corrupting us and leading us astray, to open our ears to the, to the words of his that will bring life, but we don't want to hear them. He's at work overcoming sin through his spirit so that we would have hearts that are genuinely alive, so that we wouldn't be looking to the future and thinking that it will all fall apart or looking to the present and thinking this is all there is. God is saying, I love my people. I love you. I've done everything possible from finding you in the wilderness to, to letting you roam in the wilderness for a time so you see your need for me to finally bringing you from death to life. So today, we should be a people with hope, should we not? We should be a people with joy, should we not? And we should know how to pray for those around us, not, not just for the circumstantial things of their lives, but for the deep need of their soul, that even if it means adversity and trial, that they would come to see who Jesus is, and what he's done for them. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we are humbled by what you have done for us. We're humbled because it's so clear uh, from Scripture and from our own lives that, that were it not for your work, we would be utterly lost, that this would be a story that ends in, in absolute tragedy, that we have... Um, turned our back on everything that you've done for us, God, everything you've given us, our very physical lives, the fact that we're breathing right now, the fact that, that we even have a sense of who you are, that we have a Bible to read. Lord, we have so many more even just common grace and circumstantial blessings than the people did back then, and yet still, still we allow ourselves to be seduced. Still we taste the sweetness of sin and we want more of it. Still we, we reject your authority and think that we know what's best. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would you would help us to see the error of those ways, but also, even more so, just the, the extent of your love, that you love us as we are, even right now, even with all those things against us. There's no critical eye uh, when you look at us. Your, faith is, your face is glowing because we're your children and because you know that you are going to redeem us from the inside out, make us new, give us even the, the capability of seeing who you are and responding in love, responding in faith, Lord, I pray for each one here. I pray that we would turn from those things which are leading us towards tragedy and we would embrace the hope of the gospel. And Lord, for those in our lives, Lord, maybe some here who don't have that hope, would you, would you bring an awareness of their need for you? And God, would you lead them to yourself? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. We are going to respond.